From coast to coast, live via satellite, it's time to praise the Lord. covers the major Christian events in America and across the world with the capability of reaching over 500 million souls with the good news of new life in Jesus Christ. Now from Dallas, Texas, we invite you to be a part of the world's largest prayer gathering. Center. Praise the Lord brings you live coverage of the James Robinson Crusade with anointed preaching and teaching and music to bless and inspire and lift up Jesus Christ as Lord. Now your host, President and Founders of the Trinity Broadcasting Network, Paul and James. Welcome, welcome, welcome to beautiful downtown Dallas, Texas. The convention center is beginning to ring already with the praises of God as we join up with you and the Holy Beamer and our brother James Robinson for three great nights of live telecasting. I'm excited to be in Dallas. How about you, little angel? Just absolutely excited. So great to be here. Flew in today from the beautiful dedication last night. In fact, someone came up to me just now and said, I saw you last night with Earl Roberts. How did you get here so quickly? And uh, we flew in today and are just praising the Lord. We've already seen Arthur and John Wimber and James Robinson and just all the beautiful people that are going to be ministering this week. And we're so glad that the Holy Bringer can bring this beautiful service right into your home. We love you. And we're glad to be there with you bringing you this beautiful service. You know, we have another new set tonight. Have you noticed? Thousands of God's beautiful people, and they make a pretty set too, don't they? The most beautiful <laughs> set in the world. God. You know, the service is just getting underway here, and Brother Robinson has agreed to come and just say hello to everybody. Brother James, come on over here and say hi to a lot of your friends out there tonight. How are you? I'm fine, and God bless every one of our friends. Hello, Jan. Bless you. It's exciting today already, Paul. The glory of God came down on the opening song, the introduction in the pastor's seminar, and it was it was one of the most awesome experiences of my life, the way the Holy Spirit came. People were healed, and everyone, people who had never seen it before, were able to sit and watch God's power come into people for healing and then flow through them to others. One beautiful, beautiful woman who was healed of a, of a goiter became a conduit of the Spirit of God. It was amazing. And just God touched others through her. It was, it was the most beautiful thing. John Wimber, who ministers out there in the Los Angeles area and has taught at Fuller Theological Seminary, was ministering. And it was just beautiful. We, we had registered 1,000 pastors. We had 1,700, nearly 2,000. And people are still registering tonight. We've already pre-registered nearly 10,000. And the people are still coming in. Many of them be coming in during the night, coming in for tomorrow. And we just welcome everyone on television to the Bible conference. James, I see the great banner up here. And the theme of these great nights is it's beginning to rain. What do you think that ultimate rain of God is going to be like? It's just the beginning right now, isn't it? Paul, I think that we, we have seen the mercy drops in every area. We've seen mercy drops of redemption. It's even likely that many of the people we think are saved are not. But some truly are. It's a mercy drop. We've seen the mercy drops of deliverance. We've seen the mercy drops of healing. We have seen a mercy drop only of the manifestation of love among even believers. 
I think we're going to begin to see a torrential rain mm. in all these areas, and I think we're going to see a flood. In the supernatural realm, there's going to be a flood of God's love and a flood of God's grace, a flood of everything that happened. I think that what happened in Acts, and I was just visiting with John Wimber and his wife before we came over here, what we saw in Acts was only the beginning of what we're going to see now. In other words, it's going to go beyond where we've been. Let's agree on that right now. Would you lead us in prayer? Let's join hands. You at home, join hands. Let's agree that that flood will start right here in Dallas and sweep out across America. Father, that's our prayer. Even as Tommy Williams sings about our living Lord, Lord, we pray right now that the rains of revival will begin to be poured out through the body of believers, that we will be baptized in love. And that, Lord, as we love and live in truth and the power of the Spirit, that we will see Jesus high and lifted up in his name. Amen. 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 Brother James, if time permits, come on back afterwards and do a little afterglow with us. Praise God. Tonight's going to be a great doubleheader. Not only is James Robinson going to be preaching and teaching the Word tonight, but our buddy Arthur Blessed is here. Is he still around? He was here a minute ago. And I thought we were going to have him come and join us, but I think he had to go get... I think he visited heaven a few minutes. <laughs> he just disappears, and then he'll appear just yeah. all of a sudden. <laughs> I really think he just kind of... I'll Hello, tell you Lord. what, <laughs> at the end of this program, we'll do our very best to have Arthur come and say a word. I know he wants to invite the folks in the Dallas area here to join him in a great Hallelujah Dallas, I believe, on Thursday. I'll stand corrected on that. I believe he said it would be on Thursday, but we'll have him come later on. Maybe he'll mention it in his message tonight, and we hope all you folks viewing on cable systems throughout this Dallas-Fort Worth area will join Arthur Blessed as you walk out onto the streets, into the highways and byways to compel people to come to Jesus. And of course, we hope they'll come right on into this great convention and find Christ and confess him as Lord and Savior of their lives. Well, I'm excited. I think we ought to go to church. Why do you? Amen. Well, we're going to be having a very wonderful lady. In fact, Jeannie Rogers is going to be singing for us in just a moment here. But before she comes to sing, let me just say real quickly, again, some of the wonderful friends who will uh, be speaking to us throughout these next three nights. Of course, James Robinson and uh, Arthur Blessed, uh, I see Dave Wilkerson is going to be here, Pastor Cho, pastors the world's largest church in Seoul, Korea, he's going to be with us, and let's look down the list. Peter Lord, oh, he's a beautiful Florida, brother, yes. Dave Wilkerson, Dr. Jimmy Draper. Yes, Pastor Draper is head of the Southern Baptist Convention, and we've been looking forward to meeting him, and uh, just so many, many of your wonderful friends. Of course, they have afternoon services that we won't be able to cover uh, all through the day, but those of you in the Dallas area will want to come down to the great convention center here to join in all through the day and then into the great evening services for this great, wonderful week of revival. Jeannie Rogers is going to sing a song for us right now. Let's have Jeannie sing, and then I believe Arthur Blessed will be speaking first. Let's go to camp meeting.
redemption. Zion is restored in truth and life. The praises of God's people are within her. They're worshiping their God with all their might. For it's a new day of restoration. Zion is restored in truth and life. The praises of God's people are I want to visit with you just a few minutes before Arthur Blessed comes to minister to us. And I want to really visit with you heart to heart for a few minutes. Are you able to hear me up there at all? They're doing their best. We've got a, we've got a problem. Hold it. Hold it. I can see the motions. We've got a problem that we're going to have to adjust some. If we go any louder, then we're going to lose everything. And so there'll have to be some adjustments made. We may not be able to make them all tonight, but while we're preaching and maybe there'll be a little more volume, then you'll be able to... Here, there's one or two spots where the sound is not adequate. Are you hearing well here? And out here, are you hearing well in the back? Can you hear? Wave at me if you can hear. All right. How about up here? Are you hearing? You're not hearing well. Is that correct? All right. We're going to work on these areas. So let's just be prayerfully patient because they're working on them even now. Those of you who can't hear me well, ask the Holy Spirit to just communicate with you what I'm saying and at least join in, in spirit with us. Now let me just really communicate with you for a few moments. It is not even a slight exaggeration when I tell you that already today in this complex we have ascended the hill of the Lord and we came into the presence of Holy God and we're not here in a festival. We're here again to come into the presence of Holy God. It is a new thing for us to come into the presence of Holy God. It's going to be a learning process for us to learn how to get into His presence and even more how to stay there. And we're going to all learn together, all of us, from every musician to every preacher to every announcer to every person we're going to learn. I want you to know that's why we're here, to learn of Him from Him. And we want to go into His presence and we want Him to be welcomed in our hearts and in our lives. God came down here earlier today like I have seldom ever witnessed God move. And we began in a flow. And that's how you've come here. I know that. With all my heart, I know it. If there's ever been a meeting when I pray with all my heart that not one area of our flesh will be stimulated, manipulated or motivated by someone else's flesh trying to give a charge, it's now. I'm praying that Holy God will communicate with us spirit to spirit. Isn't that what you really want? I want the Lord to so work in our lives and so transform us that we become one in Christ. I feel before I introduce Arthur Blessed. And I can't even begin to tell you how much I love him. Boy, I love you, Arthur. Dear Jesus. I really feel led to pray. Would that be appropriate, Arthur, at that, even before I introduce you? And I want you to join me in prayer.
Dear Jesus, it is not a fleshly desire that causes me in my heart to want to go again into the Holy of Holies and to behold your face, your glory, and to receive your grace, even as we have already today. I'm asking you, Father, to so come now and begin to minister to us in such a way that any hindrance, and any distraction, anything that is preceded as people have come in, any distractions while they were getting here, anything that would divide, any judgmentalism, any spirit of skepticism, judgmentalism, criticism, and division and strife, that it might this moment in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be bound and subdued. And Lord, this moment we repent of our ways and we yield our lives to you. And we ask you, Father, to change everything in our life that does not look like Jesus. Father, we say to you tonight, we are willing and ready and anxious to repent. We, Father, are as anxious to be changed as you are to change us, to conform us into the image of your dear Son, to transform us by the renewing of our minds through the power of your Word. We're asking you, Father, to allow us to behold your Son, Jesus. And may he take control of every area of our lives. Lord, how I thank you for bringing these precious people here from all over the United States and from this metroplex that we love so much. Jesus, we're not here to have another religious meeting. We're not here to magnify the flesh of any man. We're not here to manipulate the flesh of men. We're not here to magnify any person. We're here to see you high and lifted up. And Father, we invite and receive the convicting power of the Holy Spirit through the living Word of God. And I ask you in the name of Jesus to so transform us that we will never again be the same. I pray, dear God, that any unrepentant heart, that any person who's been called upon to sing, to play a musical instrument, to witness, to minister, who's not right with you will be broken by the power of the Holy Spirit now and brought to repentance this moment wherever they are. I pray, dear God, they'll not be able to lift a voice, an instrument, a song, or a message until their heart is right and pure before you. I pray, dear God, that you will so come upon us that it will be obvious Jesus is passing through. Jesus is in this house. Jesus is in this place. And may we never, never, never again be the same because we've been with Jesus. In his victorious name, we pray, amen and amen. You agree? Amen. Our hearts are one in that, aren't they? One of the most exciting weeks of my life, the Lord allowed me to spend last week with Arthur, with Jesus in Arthur and through his life, and he's blessed me so much. And I want you to simply pray for Arthur Blessed as he will come to minister the Word. Most of you know that God told him to take a 12-foot wooden cross off the wall of a mission on Sunset Strip and carry it across the nation, and ultimately he's carried it around most of the world. Arthur Blessed loves Jesus. Arthur Blessed loves you, and he wants to minister Jesus and his love to those of us here tonight. I sincerely believe he has a message from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus. We welcome and receive the message of Jesus through his vessel and servant, Arthur Blessed, don't we? God bless you. It is so good to be with you tonight. Uh, I thought when he invited me, he said, come a week early and let's get ready. Well, I thought, man, we'd get together and be witnessing all over Dallas and Fort Worth. And we went off to a ranch with nothing but a few cows and goats out there. And 
there wasn't anybody to witness to. And everybody that came, we pounced on them, didn't we? Uh, I mean, even if they were right with God, we prayed all over them. And uh, I, I was ready to go, and I thought we had a backslidden convention, but not really. We shared together praying, and Jesus ministered in my life and ministered in His life and ministered in all of our lives of those of us who were there. I am happy to be with you tonight, and I am glad to be in your presence and to have the privilege of sharing Jesus Christ. This is a Bible conference, and all I know is Jesus. When I read Genesis, I see Jesus. When I read Revelation, I see Jesus. And everything in between, I can't see anything but Jesus. Can you? I don't know really how to start off except to say to you, I love Jesus. And I am excited about Jesus. Some people love him, but they're not excited. And, I, and, and bless them, bless them, but I'm excited too. And don't think just because I'm excited, I'm not sincere, but I'm sincerely excited. And I've been that way, and I'm going to stay that way, aren't you? There are a lot of people that get excited about what the Lord is doing. But I'm excited about the Lord. And there's a lot of difference in that. Some of us have got our eyes on people being healed, and I believe in healing. But I'm excited about the healer, and that's Jesus Christ. There are many who focus on all the gifts of the Spirit, and I believe in every gift of the Holy Spirit, but I'm excited about Jesus who sent the Holy Spirit to bear witness of Him. I'm excited about baptism, but I'm more excited about the first one who was baptized by John in the River Jordan who he said, Behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. There are a lot of people excited about the second coming, but I'm excited about who is coming, and that's Jesus Christ. When there is a wedding, there are many who get excited about the flowers. When there's a wedding, there are some that get all excited about the dress. When there is a wedding, there are some that get excited about all the arrangement. But I tell you, the bride that's in love is excited about the groom. She's excited about who she's going to be with. I'm excited about Jesus. He is coming again. The theme of this conference is it's beginning to rain. I tell you all I've been thinking. Last night I laid awake till 2 this morning and dozed off, woke up at 4. My heart's prayer was let it pour, let it pour, let it pour. I can't think of any way to start off any better than having a Jesus cheer. Can you? Let's stand up, okay? and just cheer for Jesus. I'll bet this arena's had everything in it but a Jesus cheer.
glory to God. We just want to worship Jesus all night. You can forget about me. You can forget about James Robinson. You can forget about everything else. Just worship Jesus. Joshua marched around Jericho for seven days. On the seventh day, they went around seven times, and when he said, Shout! They didn't go, mm. They got it on. And the walls came down. And if there are people who can get excited about a Super Bowl and all they've got is an oblong ball, I can get excited about Jesus, the Son of the living God. Well, let's do it. Are you ready? Focus every thought and every desire upon you. These people gathered here, God, as best as we know how. And I know James and I have laid on our face weeping last week. And we've continued until now that you be glorified. And Father, I believe these people have come by the thousands from all over this nation to worship you, to be empowered with you. And we came to see Jesus and to be changed by you, to live like you. We want your mind in us. We want your desires in us. We want to witness like Jesus. We want to speak like Jesus. We want to act like Jesus. We want you to fill us, Jesus. We want you to soak us. We want you to baptize us with the Holy Spirit and with fire. We won't want to leave here the way we came. And we pray, God, that this city will be shaken with a flood of awakening. God, we invite you to do what you've been wanting to do in America for generations. Sin, sweeping, awakening, Lord. We cry, here am I, send me. And Father, we pray for your spirit now to glorify Jesus in whose name we pray, amen. You may be seated. I was 
in Mississippi College, and I was so hungry and thirsty for the empowering of the fullness of God's Spirit in my life. And I'll never forget as I was seeking every anointing of God in prayer. And every time I'd see somebody with power in their life, I'd start praying like them. I was with one preacher, a great man of God, and he'd pray laying on the floor. And I started praying laying on the floor. But all I'd do was get sleepy. I was with others who'd raise their hands and I'd raise my hands, but all I got was tired arms and no more power. And I saw another preacher I'll never forget down in Hattiesburg, and he'd pray walking. He'd just walk back and forth, and I'd do the same in my room. I'd only get tired, and I didn't have any more power. I'd see others pray with their head up, and I'd get a crick in my neck. Others would kneel and my legs would go to sleep. In frustration, I got back in my dorm room after months of hungering for God's anointing in my life. And I said, God, I'm not walking out of this room until you've shown me what it is I hunger and thirst for in my life. I'm not going to share everything that happened, but what I want to tell you is this. As I was praying in my room and as I was asking God, how to pray. I wanted the fullness of prayer and power. I'll never forget. It seemed as though the Lord spoke so clearly to me and said, if you want to know how to pray, pray like me. I thought, I never thought of that. <laughs> I, I, I was looking at everybody else. I opened my Bible and I can speed read. Every time I saw Jesus pray and I'd stop and I'd write it all down, where he was, what he said, how long he prayed, what he talked about, everything about it. And I'd turn to the next passage where Jesus prayed. And I said, oh God, I want to pray like Jesus. And God began to focus me into this very reality. If you want to know what to do with your money, look at Jesus. If you want to know what to do with your time, look at Jesus. If you want to know what to do about the poor, look at Jesus. If you want to know what to do with your enemies, look at Jesus. See Jesus. And as I studied and looked, it has been the pursuit of my life that I might know all His fullness and for Him to have mercy on me and make me like Jesus. I remember praying, going down through Central America, Paul and Jan, and as I was going down through there one day, man, I tell you, going on and on, and I remember as I prayed about all the world and everything, and God said, God, what are you doing to me? And it seemed like the Lord said, I'm grinding you to powder so I can blow you where I will. My prayer is that we might look at Jesus and live like Him. It is because of Jesus that I'm a Christian. Many times I've said, Lord, if it weren't for Jesus... I wouldn't be one, would you? I'd have quit long ago. But Jesus is real. And He is Lord. I had a shoe company try to get me, not these shoes, but the shoes I walk in. And they wanted to get me to uh, do an advertisement for them, give me shoes, a lot of money, and they'd be my sponsor. I said, hey, man, I wouldn't take one step for all the money in the world, but I'd go anywhere for Jesus. I'm not going to walk for a shoe company. Somebody said, Arthur, you've walked now almost 21,000 miles. That's more than anybody in the Guinness Book of Records. Are you in Guinness's book? I said, I'm not interested in Guinness's little book. 
I'm interested in the book of life. I want to be in God's book. In 1969, I was praying right here at Dallas, Texas. I was ministering on Sunset Strip and I was preaching at First Baptist Church Garland. And I preached that night at the stadium and went down to a, a nightclub here in Dallas called The Cellar. Do any of you remember that old nightclub? And uh, maybe it's a holy bunch here. Uh, but, uh, th but I was there and I preached. And that night after I finished preaching at The Cellar, I went back to the room and there in that motel in North Dallas, I was praying. God said, I want you to pray all night long. I'll never know what would have happened if I'd have stopped at 4 o'clock. I'll never know what would have happened if I'd have stopped at 4.30. But at 5 o'clock in the morning as I knelt beside my bed, Jesus spoke ever so clear in my heart. Arthur, take that cross hanging on the wall of your building in Hollywood and carry it on foot across America and give your life to carry it around the world. And I, in that moment, call my wife. I don't know about you. I'm excited anything Jesus says to me. Some people say, well, if it feels good, you shouldn't do it. Man, we ought to. Well, everything God says feels good to me. I just love to do anything he says. And he said, do it. I called my wife on the phone and I said, Sherry, God wants me to take the cross and carry it across America. And Sherry said, when are we leaving? We had four children at the time and now we've got six, Jenna, Joel, Joy, Joshua, Joseph, and Jerusalem. And we're on the road for God. Two weeks before I was to leave, I had a stroke and was paralyzed on much of the right side of my body and was in Glendale Adventist Hospital in Los Angeles and laying there in the bed, the doctor said, you need surgery in your brain about more than half an inch in. There's a swollen aneurysm and that's why I'd had four strokes in three years. And he said, you, you're at the, you've got to have surgery now. Laying in bed, praying, I'd said, I, I can't do it right now. I'm supposed to leave next week carrying a cross across America. He knew I was touched then, and <laughs> I have prayed, and I was torn between what God had said and the doctor said and the condition I was in, and laying there, I made a decision. I said, I'd rather die in the will of God than live outside of it. Ed Human is here with his wife. He was there with me that morning and a whole group as I started off down Sunset Boulevard, sick as could be. By God's grace, I've now walked through 68 countries. I've been in jail 28 times. I've been beaten and stoned and shot at, taken out before a firing squad to be shot. Nearly anything you can imagine. I've eat things you wouldn't want to touch. I... I have drank water I wouldn't bathe in. It's the truth. I'd go days. I did bathe this afternoon, but I'm still in dirty clothes. Did you know I've been wearing these clothes? He's got my suitcase. And, and I came in here this afternoon, and he didn't give it to me, and so I, these are my same dirty clothes. But anyway, I'm really clean on the inside of these dirty clothes, but I have drank water I wouldn't bathe in. I have been in, in Africa. I walked two years across Africa, two years and one month from Sierra Leone to Tanzania. And many times I'd be in the jungles, have to dip in an old muddy hole. And there, old green stuff and wiggly things in it, I'd dip, I'd say, in the name of Jesus, kill them all. And I'd just drink it down. I tell you, by the grace of God, I've never been sick a day and this starts my 15th year and I never felt better in my life. Glory to God. Jesus is everything. That's all I know, just everything. I used to, people say, do you mean you walk between towns? You don't ride? Hey, don't, I don't want to ride between towns. 
That gives me eight hours of praying before I get to town. I don't like for people, James, to walk with me and talk unless they're local people I'm training. I want to talk with Jesus. And you know what I found? As I walk, I'll stop and I'll just sit down somewhere and I'll just read a Scripture verse for a minute with my pocket Bible. And for the next hour or two hours, I just think about that verse and about Jesus. And I say, Lord, for the next day, I just want this verse to become part of me. Just take it one verse at a time, kind of, and let it soak in. Oh, I know, maybe I got messed up because living on the road now 15 years, I can't take along any commentaries. It's been so, I don't know what anybody else is saying but Jesus. I'm not putting down commentaries. I hadn't had a chance to read them. Any as busy as I am, every time I get, if, I'm, if I hadn't got but a few minutes, I just open it up and read the red. I, I want to read the red words. <laughs> I know all the Word of God's the same, but those red ones thrill me. <laughs> Some scholar, did they write the originals in red there when Jesus said it? Uh, I don't know, but I know this Jesus will be with you. All I know is in a day as you go, when you're tired, God's Spirit will just come on and you can just go and go and go. Some guy came up a while ago, said, I sold everything I got. I came here. I need answer to some question. How do you keep going? Listen, brother, Jesus keeps you going. He's enough. He's more than enough. And He's all you can stand. And so many times all I can do is just go, mm. <laughs> and, mm. Hallelujah, the Spirit beareth witness that He is Lord and He lives within our life. And what I'd like to share with you just briefly, and I'll try to move fast, is this. There is no limit with what God can do to those that live like Jesus. Live like Him and everything else will follow. Live like Him. Love like Him. Think like Him. Be like Him. Maybe in all the world, in all history, there's no one that has been physically shaped by the cross as I have. My shoulder has over an inch of bone growth because of the years of carrying that big 12-foot cross. But see, that doesn't mean a thing. But I pray that my life has been shaped by the weight of the cross, by the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, that He's been able to chip away and bring me into conformity to Himself. And if there's anything that I've learned, it's this, I believe what the world needs is a group of people who don't know what God can't do. And we'll turn it upside down. Just if, if we today had no idea, I don't believe that guy on the second, second guy, what's his name? Jamie from El, El Salvador. Stand up there, Jamie. He hadn't learned yet that God can't do anything. Amen, Jamie? Hallelujah. And that's all we needed to believe God, to move and to go. I was in Germany and I'd been in Berlin and was coming back and my car broke down at the East German, West German border. And as I was there, I prayed for God to fix it, but it didn't start. Now my motto, would y'all like for me to tell you how I deal with the devil? Okay, now this is, it's funny, but it's real and I guarantee that's how I live. I figured God had fixed the car. If the devil broke it down, God will fix it. And if it doesn't get fixed, then I figure God broke it down. And that's how I live. Now, if I'm going in an airport and I'm flying somewhere and the plane doesn't take off and they say it's going to be three hours, I pray, Lord, fix it. If it doesn't take off, I say, it must be the devil. I'm going to give him a run for his money. I'm going to give them moonies a fight in this airport. I'm fixing to get those hired Christians, and I go to witnessing. 
And I tell you, if, there's the, if the devil's causing the trouble, he gets me, get him moving, get his thing going, get him out of my town. My motto is, if anything goes wrong, preach. If anything's right, preach. Just preach the Word in season and out of season. Go into all the world. Today, I mean, it was glorious. I came back from Canada, been carrying the cross up there in Nova Scotia. Can you believe it? 14 below zero. And anyway, came out of the airport and getting the cross on the plane is a long story in itself. But anyway, in Toronto, that's today. I got up at four this morning and we did a nationwide program in Canada, 100 Huntley Street. But anyway, in Toronto, you got to check through customs and my cross wasn't there. And I said... <laughs> I said, I've got to have my cross down there. James wants us to carry the cross. Tomorrow at about 4 or 5 when we close, he said, would you just carry the cross right out and lead all 10,000 people right out in the streets of Dallas? Are you ready to go tomorrow and just go out there? We're not going to ask for a march. Just everybody scatter like a bunch of birds and witness to everybody on two feet. Just go into the streets. And so anyway, we fly in here, and did you know, because of the witness of my cross, they sent this telegram. They said, uh, uh, when I got here with Air Canada, it says, uh, found one large, long, holy cross. And they delivered it to that hotel tonight. I hope they're ready when they come hauling the cross into that hotel. <laughs> but I was in Germany. I said, God, just stop me. What are you trying to say? And I felt like the Lord say to me, you've been praying when you should go behind the iron curtain. I don't have an iron curtain. I said, oh, God, I've spent years praying for the people behind the Iron Curtain. Do you want me to go behind the Iron Curtain? God doesn't have an Iron Curtain. That's a news media term. That's a political term. I said, God, forgive me. Now I call them Eastern Europe. I call them communist countries, anything else. But God doesn't have an iron curtain. The iron curtain is in our mind. And I came back, got a visa there in London, got on a lot of airlines to go to Poland. If I go to a country, I fly in. If I'm going in like that with the folks of that country, went into Warsaw, no problem with immigration, customs, trying to get my big cross through. And finally, they get somebody can speak English, uh, they were all going there, cuckoo all I'll ever they were doing. I thought it was a charismatic convention myself, but I <laughs> found out they were speaking Polish, and they got somebody to speak English, and they finally, they said, are you taking this with you, and are you going to leave it or take it out? I said, I'm going to take it out when I go. They gave me a receipt, brought in one cross, can take one cross out, stamped it, and I didn't see another official for a month. I have been to Poland the last three years. A few months ago in August, I walked for nine days with 60,000 people for 160 miles, over 1,000 priests going with us. I tell you, God is moving. Carried the cross through Hungary. <laughs> Carried the cross through Yugoslavia. Carried the cross in Bulgaria. On and on. I was praying and sharing. I've walked through seven Muslim countries and I tell you, God will be with you. From Yasser Arafat in Lebanon in Beirut to sleeping in Begin's house there near El Arish to getting the Sinai Peace Medal from the Muslims in Egypt. I'm telling you, Jesus doesn't have an iron curtain and He doesn't have any closed doors. Since the resurrection of Jesus after he had been crucified, every door is open. He said, whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and loose on earth shall be loosed 
in heaven. It's the same Jesus. We don't have a theological Jesus today that's any different from the physical Jesus that walked 2,000 years ago. There is no limit on His power. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you need to believe it and live like it. It's the same one. Remember when He ascended into heaven, the two angels stood by and the disciples were looking up. I think those angels gave him an elbow. What you guys doing? Still looking up. The same one that's going up is going to come again in like manner as you've seen him go. Some people ask me, when do you think he's coming again? I say, I believe right now, but I don't know. But I'm concerned that my life is filled with power that I may be a witness of this living Jesus now. And I promise you, if you're so busy living for Jesus and witnessing till you don't hear the trumpet sound nor the shout of the archangel, Jesus will come down and tap you on your shoulder and take you with Him. You're not going to miss it. Don't worry about it. He's coming for you. No limit on His power. What we need in our heart is for Him to shape us and make us like Him. Remember on the Mount of Transfiguration, they saw Moses and Elijah and Jesus. They said, let's make three tabernacles. One for Moses, one for Elijah, one for Jesus. And I tell you, when you begin to put Jesus on the same level of all the rest, you've missed the point. The voice of God cried out and said, This! is my beloved Son. Hear ye Him. Hear Jesus. If we had Moses, we'd have the law. If we had Elijah, we'd have judgment and a bloody sword. But when we have Jesus, we have grace and mercy and power and fullness. Everything points to Him. And He wants to change us I'll never forget as I've gone on the roads in many places where there have been no churches for miles and miles, sometime for as much as two weeks, no church of any kind, and people are being saved by the crowds. What do you do with them? I've been with missionaries who cried and said, Arthur, I can't go any further. I can't even follow up what we've already got. But you can't not go because nobody else will follow up. You've got to go anywhere and believe like when uh, the Ethiopian eunuch was saved, God will just be with him. And like the demoniac. And when I preach like that all across Africa, South America, other places, all I do is say to this crowd, and many are converted, I say, does anybody speak English that's saved? If they speak English, that's a big point in their favor. And there will be some raise their hand. If none do... Through the interpreter, I ask something else, and usually I have local Bibles, just a few to give out, one or two to a village. And I'll say, maybe let's say there's somebody speaks English, and uh, there's several of them, and I'll just pray, God, which one of these do you want to be the pastor here? And I'll just pray, and I'll say, you, sir, are the pastor. Say, pastor. Pastor, I say, this is your church. Come up here. This is a Bible. And this section back here tells about how God made the world and He told us what was right and wrong and showed us how we all messed up and sinned. And it told that somebody was coming to be our Savior who would die for the sins of the world. This little section is called the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it tells you about Jesus. Now, this is really all you need to know, but it tells you about Him. Just study it and live like Him. And then there's a little teeny book right here called the Book of Acts. Now, you just do everything that's in it. And if you get messed up and don't know what to do, this little bit will straighten you out. And I give him a Bible and leave him alone. 
If you've got a better idea, then you go and follow me up. But I'm not afraid that Jesus is going to miss himself for you. He will be glorified. But I'll tell you what, when we see Jesus, we see the multitudes, don't we? We see the fields white unto harvest. I was going through Africa. I was in Sierra Leone and in an area called Zephidu. And it was so hot. And it's in a dry area and near Senegal. And it was in, in Liberia. And there's an area called Zephidu. And it's a diamond mining area. And it's open pit. And everywhere you look, there's just digging, digging, digging. Everything has been dug up because you may find a diamond. And people have come in there by the hundreds of thousands. They're everywhere. And they're digging and they're living in little old huts. And you see children with bony legs and huge pot bellies. And they're starving and old men and women. And they got, like you've seen in picture, little old flies on their eyes. They're so sick they can't even swat them off. And, and illness and disease. And there was one Methodist missionary and his wife. She was a nurse and he was a missionary preacher. And, and while I was at their place, he came out on the road, invited me in. And I went with them and they were with me and we'd just preach. And we got to their little church and... and and after ever, I'd preach a while and then we'd say, everybody that's just prayed and received Jesus, go in the church. And when they'd fill it up, they'd shut the door and I'd keep preaching and he'd do follow-up. And then we'd just break one load after another into the church for give them some teaching. But anyway, finally he said to me, Arthur, he said, go with me. We left the cross. One afternoon got in his Land Rover and drove to an area where there was a huge barbed wire fence and there were soldiers patrolling it, and this was the diamond mine. And he was the right color, and so we drove in, and they knew him. Inside was a beautiful golf course. There was a swimming pool, a bar and a lounge, a nice supermarket, a little hospital. There was doctors. Everything you could imagine was there. It was like a little America and little Europe. And I met all the people and finally they asked me if, if I'd preached that night and they all gathered. When they gathered, I, it was one day that the Lord told me not to witness. James, I've hardly ever had that happen in my life. God said, don't witness. They'll all be here tonight. Just listen. When I stood up that night, I had heard, and this is what I said. I said, I've listened to what you have to say. None of you are here because of the people. You're here for a rock that sparkles called a diamond. You hate the tetsa flies. You hate the flies. You hate the mosquitoes. You hate the dirt. You hate all this disease. You hate all these people swarming around you everywhere you are. I said, the only reason you're here is for a rock that sparkles. I tell you, the real diamonds of Zephidu are not the rocks, but the people. The people are the diamonds. And all those diamonds need are to be shaped and cut and chipped and made into a beautiful thing. You see, a diamond isn't necessarily beautiful. You can't tell it hardly from a rock until it has been cut and polished. My dear friends, Many of us have got interested in the diamonds of this world and we've lost the vision. The diamonds are the people. There is no barbed wire and barricade that separates God from us. He wants to change our lives. He wants to give us a new sense of value, a new direction of seeing the world like Jesus sees it. I remember in Los Angeles driving down the street one night riding in a car with a man of God, wonderful man. But as we were going down the street after I'd been showing him and sharing and he was following along with me, 
And there was a man laying in the gutter along the curb of the street with water running by. And I said, man, see that guy? And he looked and he began to tell me how bad alcoholism was. And as he told me about drunkenness, he kept driving. Finally, I said, stop your car. I said, I don't need your sermon about drunks. A guy's laying in the gutter and you preach me a sermon. And he stopped his car and I jumped out. I ran back to that guy. I got him up in my lap. I said, come on, man. I said, I'm going to get you up and sober you up. You'll get saved in the morning because I'm taking you to my house. And I got him. The guy didn't know where, you know, he's coming around like this. And I get him up. I said, God bless you, brother. Jesus loves you. The guy had backed his car up and he got out and I started leading him over to the car. He said, what are you doing? I said, going to get him in the car take him home. I said, that guy's going to get saved tomorrow. And he stood there nervously looking. I said, what's wrong? He said, he's going to, well, I don't see anything to put on my seat covers. He's going to mess my seat covers up. I said, oh my, I'll buy you new seat covers. A man's laying in the gutter and you're worried about your seat covers. You see, if we're only tourists in this world, we can pass the world by. But my dad was an alcoholic. I grew up in bars and nightclubs from the time I was four. My dad's life was changed when I was 13 years old. I've helped pick my dad up out of his own vomit. You don't laugh and joke at drunks when you care, when your burden is there. I ask you, Christians, are we touring this world or are we living for Jesus in this world? There are great speakers coming here, but I tell you, it's Jesus we need to hear and it's Him who needs to shape our life and transform us. I'm going to close with this story. I was in Amsterdam this past summer carrying the cross through Europe and there preaching in the streets every day for two weeks with about 300 youth with a mission young people. And I was doing a morning teaching and in the afternoon we'd carry the cross, stand the cross up in the street and preach and move down the street. They'd sing and do drama and then we'd preach again. And I'd finished the teaching and was going to get the cross a few blocks away. As I walked down the street and uh, was there with Floyd McClung of YWAM and another guy named Barry and somebody hollered, Arthur, you need it here. And I looked and I saw a crowd of people and I heard something boom, boom, like that, banging. And I walked through and looked and this horrible scene, there was a man who had plunged his arm through a glass window and had cut his arm terribly. And there was a steel-like telephone or electrical container on the street and he was standing, banging his head on the steel container. His head was cut to the bone, blushing, I mean gushing blood running down his face and a crowd stood watching him die. I ran in and Floyd and Barry and I grabbed the guy's arm to cut off the gushing blood and he turned to hit me and I stepped back. Jesus loves you, man. Jesus loves you. I bind you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. Let this man be free. And I began to pray for him and grabbed his arm again and he turned to hit me. And, and I, you know, finally I looked at him. I said, man, I'm going to grab you again. I'm not going to fight you but I'm not going to let you die. I'll just, you can beat me, but you'll, when you're beating me, you can't beat yourself. We love you. I said, but I can't let you die. Jesus has already shed his blood. Do you understand English? And he began to curse in English, and I knew he did. And finally, I said, we're going to hold your arm. I said, I'm going to do that. Whatever you're going to do, he looked at me and drew back to hit me and he turned 
and just fell over into Barry's arms. And Barry hugged him. The guy looked at me, threw back his fist again, and then just fell into my arms and began to cry like a baby. I held him in my arms and I prayed over him. And then he began to pray and he prayed the prayer and invited Jesus, James, to come into his heart and to save him. And the ambulance soon came and some went with him to the hospital. I went back to the room. Never forget when I stood there by the sink to wash my hands. I had blood from my head to my feet. And I stood there to wash my hands before I touched anything in the bathroom. And when I started washing my hands and face, the, my, the blood of that man began to mix with the water. And like a dagger, I thought, a pilot, as he sought to wash his hands of Jesus. Then it speaks. You can't wash your hands of a hurt, lost, sick, and dying world. Their blood is on your hands. My friend, it would be the easiest thing for us to slip into isolated holiness, to withdraw from a sick, polluted world, and don't get me wrong, but dig deeper and deeper in the Word until we're not even, don't even know where the surface is. And pray and pray and pray and pray and pray. But let me hear, and you hear me, if you pray right, before long you'll hear God saying, do something. But some of us have been praying and moaning and groaning and saying, God, Dallas needs revival. Lord, America needs revival. Lord, do something. And the God I serve is already convinced. It's you that needs to get convinced. And we beg God, oh God, save John. God already, Jesus already died for John. I think the Lord's wanting to say, shut up and get up there and do something. Go. We need to pray. And we need to study God's Word. And then we need to live and reach out into this lost, dying world. Samuel said these words. Samuel said, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. I want to hear God. I'm ready to do God's will. Isaiah said it this way, Here am I, Lord. Send me. Everybody we meet in this city, those hotel clerks, those restaurant waitresses, the gas station attendants, all around us, I tell you tonight, if we're able to see Jesus and are filled with His love, you can't be silent. You have to go. He is the answer. Nothing is impossible. All I know is Jesus is real. All I know is that He's worth living for all the way. All I know is He'll hear your prayer. All I know is He'll change your life. Give Him your life. That's all I can recommend. If you've never received Jesus Christ, ask Him to be your Savior. If you've already received Him, say to Him, God, here am I. Send me. I know many of us are making commitments in our life. But I believe James Robinson is coming in a moment to preach. And I believe I just feel to leave every invitation into the hands of this man of God. And let me just say this. With all my heart, James 
is a real man of God. I mean, God, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm just saying, I, I want to, we have been together for days. I didn't really get to know him until the end uh, of, well, the end of November, the 1st of December. And I pray that we be sensitive as God speaks through him tonight to our hearts each of us within ourselves to make a commitment with Jesus that is real. Real. If you've never received Jesus, right now just say, Jesus, come in and save me. Change me. Others of you as believers, let God's will be done in your life. I love you. I pray for you. I ask you to pray for me. And together these days, we don't want to leave the same, do we? I don't want to walk out of here tonight the same. Let's see this city changed. Let's have our life changed by the power of God. Praise God. Let's stand together. Thou art worthy As we pause for just a moment at the great Dallas Civic Auditorium here for some local ministry and an offering to be received, I'd like to take just a moment to invite people across this great network who've heard this tremendous challenge from the Word of God, from our brother Arthur Blessed, to just bow down your heart wherever you are. Just stop whatever you're doing. I know the Holy Spirit has moved in convicting power across America. Some of you aren't living in obedience to the Word and to the will of God, and you know it. Some of you have felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Some of you have never committed your life to the Lord Jesus, as you know that you should, and as the Word of God has now brought light to you. Arthur, Jan, join me right now. And I think this would be a tremendous opportunity to just let people receive the Lord Jesus. I know the Word has done its work. I know the conviction is heavy and strong. And some are going to want to bow now and receive Him and recommit their lives to the Lord Jesus. Right. Paul, it's just great to be with you. And, <laughs> and, um, and I just have to say this. I love you and Jan so much. And you know, I, it, it means so much for you to come here and to make this available because right now there are thousands of people I believe that want this real Jesus yes. they want to know how to be in touch with God don't you you want to know him see it's no game or any trick or any gimmick you know with all our heart with all my heart it's the only reason we're here it's the only reason Amen. 
Man, I tell you, I've been going. I was so tired when I got in this afternoon. And yet God just keeps, man, I'd rather burn out than rust out. I want the last breath. With my last breath, I want to cry out on TV in, Jesus saves. And he loves you. And right now, those of you who have been listening, and Jesus is calling you, you say, I want Jesus in my heart. I believe in him. Maybe you've been turned off by religion. Maybe you've been turned off by failures in somebody's life, in mine, in some preachers, in some churches. I don't know. But don't miss Jesus. Amen. And when you know Jesus, you'll be able to forgive those who have even hurt you. Trust Jesus. He is real. Invite him into your life. Know him now. And you can, we'll, we'll help you to pray a prayer. You know, the marvelous thing that TBN is always doing is making available. Pray a prayer. Let people come to Jesus. That's the heartbeat of this whole network is that you might meet God. That's why the preachers preach. The Bibles are printed. That's why Jesus came. And you can have him now. I know you can't wait. I don't believe it's a, a matter of trying to urge people. Paul, I just feel like there are so many right now that just want to know the Lord. Will you pray with me now and just say to him, God, I need you. God, I need you. I've loved you. I've loved you. I've wanted to know you. I've wanted to know you. I've wanted to know Jesus. I've wanted to know Jesus. Right now. Right now. God have mercy on me. God have mercy on me. Forgive my sins. Forgive my sins. Save my soul. Save my soul. Make me a new person. Make me a new person. Change my life. Change my life. Jesus, I repent. Jesus. And I want to live with you. And I want to live with you. From now on. From now on. Amen. 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 Many of you just did that. There's a number on your screen. Just run over to the phone. Yeah, I mean, even run, you know, and just dial the number and say, hey, Paul and Jan, Arthur, everybody. And if the number's busy, just raise the window and holler out, I got saved, you know, or <laughs> go down to 7-Eleven and tell them or dial O and tell the operator. You got to tell somebody. And then share with us. We'll send you a Bible, some follow-up. But, you know, I believe right now they're also... So many Christians say, I, I didn't feel that I should give the invitation in the, in the auditorium. I, I felt like that, that, that's to let Jane, there's another message coming there. But for many of us as Christians, it's a time to sell out to God. Some of you have had your mind on all the other things. You've had your eyes on the diamonds of this world. And, it, it, and you've lost the vision of the hurting people. And Jesus will give you that. He'll open your eyes. Ask God to take away that old cold heart, that old resentful attitude, that bitter spirit. And just say, Lord, I want to be happy living with you. I, I want you to fill me with love for everybody and give me the fire, the want to. See, God isn't bashing you over the head telling you, you got to do this and got to do that. He fills you so full you just want to, don't Amen. you? You can't shut up. Uh, Paul, Go. I mean, do you want to start new TV stations? I want to go are, 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 are we yes. just begging you and people saying, oh, will you do, please do no. something? Or do you want? <laughs> Paul, you've got the want to for a tower. I tell you, he's God's tower, man. And God will give you, you see, desires. The want to. The want to. Ask him now. Let's just pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for believers. Those who have said yes to you as Lord and Savior. And then the old world's choked us down. And we've looked for open doors. And we've, we've just been moaning and groaning and complaining. God, open our eyes to see Jesus, Lord. And to rush out and tell the good news to everybody, Lord. Now, change us, Lord. Pour out your spirit. And awaken our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Arthur, people are going to do that right now. Move to your phones. Call the numbers on your screen. Prayer partners are standing by. But I want to tell you, Arthur, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart in this meeting tonight. You flat preached me under conviction. And, of course, you know, Jan and I are out working for God. We're doing things. But, you know, it's, it's possible, and, and this is so subtle, it's possible to get so busy sometimes, doing good things and right things and things God has even called you to do till you neglect your personal relationship with 
Jesus himself. And I think that's what the Spirit of the Lord is calling us all to in this. I sense a, a, a direction already just in the first few moments of this great week. And you know, the Spirit of the Lord spoke a, 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 a scripture, and I looked it up as, as you were preaching, that I know he wants us to share in this little break here. You know, I know what a lot of the body of Christ are saying out there. They're saying, well, sure, you know, and Arthur, bless it, prays till five in the morning. God speaks and tells him he's to carry a cross. You know, Jan and I have talked about how God took us through the fires and told us to build TV stations and so on. Well, that's fine for Paul and Jan and Arthur, but listen, I want to tell you something. The Word speaks to you, and this is the Scripture the Holy Spirit just burned into my heart. In John chapter 14, verse 11, Jesus is speaking. He says, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily I say unto you, He that believeth on me. Now that doesn't say just Arthur Blessed. That doesn't say just Paul and Jan. Mm. He hey, that man. believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. Hey. And greater works than these like shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you, child of God, you grandmother, you little boy or girl, whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. For if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Oh, is that speaking to you out there? Is that speaking to me? Yes, it is. And the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the mm. saint of God that feels the least and the weakest and the most inadequate and the most unable to do anything, he's saying greater works than these. What works? The works that Jesus did. Mm. The weakest little saint or child of God is to do greater works than even Jesus himself did. Ooh, if that'll ever get down and hit bottom in our spirits, it'll absolutely turn this body of Christ loose. It was just what I was saying. Just if we have a group of people that don't know what God can't do. You see, exactly. if you just read it and believed it and did it. Yes. Yeah. You know, in a way, those precious little converts that you just deliver a Bible to, they're almost ahead of us, aren't they? They haven't right. had That's their right. minds messed up they by... They have to unlearn. Uh-huh. Yeah. Unlearning. I had to unlearn so much. Not only learn, but unlearn. Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. <laughs> Say me amen, Sister Crouch. Amen, Sister Brother Crouch. <laughs> I tell you, I told Arthur as we were coming out here tonight, I... I... In, I've heard those stories all before, but tonight they were very special. And I know that they are taking root, and I know people are going to realize who the diamonds of this world are, who is beautiful, those little angel men laying in the gutters. Arthur, we've walked the street so many times together and seen them and ministered to them. And that is Jesus' hand extended. That is what he is is most important to him. Can you imagine? You know, I see when you were telling that story again about the preacher who wouldn't let the drunk get in mm -hmm. his back. The back seat of that car will be rotted a million mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. And that man's soul mm -hmm. will live for eternity right. somewhere. That's right. And what, how can you value a car over a human mm -hmm. being? And I just, you know, mm -hmm. I, Paul said it and I said it. We've heard them, but mm -hmm. it, it took on a new meaning tonight. Mm -hmm. And I just love you for you know, sharing. It's that. just seeing, it's trying to look at the world through the eyes of Jesus, isn't it? He said, here am I, send me. He said, the harvest is ripe. It's plenty, but the labor is a few. It's to look at the, look at people, to see people people and you see precious men and precious women you know like a diamond have you ever seen a diamond in the natural yes. you you can't t you can't it looks like a stone doesn't it mm -hmm. it's when it's cut and polished that that 
It takes a skilled eye to tell a diamond from a regular rock. It's just not sparkling like you see in a Tarzan movie, you know. <laughs> and, and that's what God sees in us. See, if we could see everybody, we say, but that guy, look at his life. That woman, look at her life. Look at his life. It's seeing that person the way they are, but knowing they can be changed. But what the Spirit of God is saying is everyone is a diamond miner. Mm -hmm. Everyone. See, we've left it all up to Arthur Blessed mm -hmm. or to Christian television or the pastor or mm -hmm. the missionary or somebody. We've just kind of shoveled it off on somebody else. But this Bible says you. You. Greater works shall oh, you I'm ready, Paul. do. Glory be to you. You know what? We have been taught wrong. Do you know what? We have even... Now, this is going to be a little bizarre and a little radical. We've even built our churches wrong. We've built the churches with the little parishioners down on the floor and the pastor up on a big high platform mm -hmm. and some on a very high elevator. You know, and it's kind of like we've... Even the symbolism is wrong, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, yes. we, we've put this great gap between the laity and the clergy and, and the parson and the... And, and the people, you know, the sheep and, and the, the shepherd. No, we are laborers together yeah. with God. Right. We are, we ought to be right out there. Sheep, somebody once said, bear sheep. That's right. Not the shepherd. The shepherd doesn't bear no. the sheep. He tends them, he leads them, he guides them, he directs them, he cares for them and nurses them and takes care. But the sheep really bear the sheep. Mm. And that's what this Arthur Blessed's been telling us for how many years now? I don't know. That we got to get out there and go and do something. You've built a fire under me tonight, Arthur. I'm ready to hit the streets with you. Tomorrow we're going, Arthur. That's right. Isn't that going to be great? Well, hallelujah, Dallas. Just <laughs> came up with it quick, but I don't think it's going to be holy confusion out there as we lead these people into Dallas. You know, just go out the door. Traffic's liable to pile up, no telling what's going to go on. But just loose them out there sharing Jesus Christ. You know, I think James Robinson is just so special because how many, okay, now we've been nutty enough to do this and, you know, hit Hollywood. How yeah. many hallelujahs have we done across America? But, you know, there are not many national figures like a James Robinson who will just turn you loose, is there? Mm -mm. And let and, you just lead the whole convention out on the street. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know another thing that I must say <coughs> about him that is so <coughs> astounding. And, I, you know, it's a Bible conference that God's put on his heart. And if you look at any brochure except the program, I'm not even on it. I, I, I didn't even accept till Christmas to come. And God has touched him, and he had me preach at the beginning and, and at the end. I mean, he's the most unselfish. God's at work in him. I think mm. the offering's over, and we're ready to go back. This is going to be, a, as I said, a double header Ooh. tonight. Arthur Blessed has blessed you with the message. Now James Robinson's going to bless you. Real quickly, for the folk viewing in Dallas tonight, it'll be what time? Four About o'clock? About four o'clock. Just afternoon. come to the convention center here. Thursday uh, afternoon. Thursday afternoon. Okay. Uh, the 24th, right? Uh, tomorrow will be the 24th. Uh, no, the 26th, 26. the 26th, yeah, the 26th, and just just be ready to go. Just meet us downtown, praising the Lord and sharing right. Jesus. We're ready to go back right now. Let's move back to the great convention center here in Dallas, Texas, as it's beginning to rain. Brother James Robinson's going to bring a message right after a special number and song. See Jesus to
if that's your prayer, he'll answer it. Amen? You may be seated. I would like to introduce you to, in my opinion, the most beautiful lady in the world, my wife, Dixie. Come right up here. Bless you. Would you stand on the other side? I'd like to sing a song about seeing Jesus, and Dixie's going to interpret. Gary? The sky shall unfold, preparing his entrance. The stars will applaud him with thunder. light in his eyes shall enhance those awaiting and we shall behold We shall behold 
face in all of his glory. We shall behold him. We shall. I enjoyed Dixie Williams and the beautiful sign and interpretation of that message. Tommy Williams, thank you. Many of you have not met Tommy Williams unless you've seen him on television with us or you happen to be in one of the crusades since March of last year. This is the first Bible conference that Tommy's had the opportunity of sharing with us. He has been called of the Lord to minister alongside since March of last year. Could we just sort of say, Tommy, we love you and we welcome you as a part of the ministry of Jesus right here. We love you. Thank the Lord for you. How many of you came from outside the state of Texas? May I see your hands if you're from outside the state of Texas? Why don't you stand? I'd like to see you from outside the state of Texas. Would you just stand? Could the rest of us just say a welcome to you, all of you? God bless you. You may be seated. How many others of you came from beyond the Metroplex, the Dallas-Fort Worth area? Let me see your hands. Why don't you stand also? Stand up also. We welcome you to our area where we live, all of you. Bless you. Thank God for you. There'll be more coming in tomorrow already. Before we even got here, there had been over 7,000 people who had registered from out of state and out of the Metroplex, and then thousands of others and many others coming in, most probably, uh, will be coming in even tomorrow. So we just thank the Lord for all of you, and we praise God for what He's begun to do already. And I feel that the Lord would have me share with you in the area of expectation even before I began to minister the Word to you. Let me just ask if you're hearing all right now. Are you hearing all right back here and down here? Have you ever started to hear yet? Just fairly. See, the Lord's already healed a whole section of people who couldn't hear. Isn't that wonderful? I think He just healed the sound system or somebody fixed it. But we'll continue to try to improve that so you know we want to communicate with you and we want to help you. I have such a, a surge of, of desire, the desire of Jesus within me to see you ministered to. Now, I'm a preacher, and I love to preach, but the Lord is leading me sometimes to preach sitting down. I'm wondering when he's going to bid me preach laying down. I thought Arthur was going to a moment ago. But the Lord is letting me know that anything that interferes in His communicating truth, love, and life must change in James Robinson. And I don't want anything in my life to interfere with what God is doing. 
And above all, the importance of my preaching, and that's so important because God uses that proclaimed word in power. I know that ministry, the ministry of Jesus to you is an imperative this week. And although I may preach much and hopefully under the anointing, there's an overriding desire in my heart to see Jesus Christ minister to you. And I want you to know as a little sheep that there's no desire on my part or the part of any person ministering here to lead a little needy sheep in here and get the last bit of fleece from your body before you go home. I don't want anything from you. I really know that. And you can't imagine how good it is to say that and know that I mean it. I mean if everything I've ever known and everything I've ever been a part of crashes tonight, I stand on a solid foundation that the gates of hell will never shake. And I am so secure in where I stand that if God bid me get on the back end of Arthur Blessed's holy cross he's carrying and we'll go on a holy tour around the world, Arthur. I am so secure... I'm telling you, there's nothing in me seeking the approval of men. I want Jesus to look down here tonight and say, I am pleased. And I know that he will be pleased when he is permitted, yea, even invited and welcome to minister as only he can minister to you. I can honestly say I do not want there to be a single person leave this place even tonight, not touched by Jesus. I do not want anyone to come to this conference and fail to miss an encounter with Christ that has life-changing and eternal effect. I want Jesus to touch you. And I declare to you by the authority of his word that there is no area of your life he's not sufficient to touch and to meet every need. Jesus Christ wants to minister to you tonight and this week. Let me tell you some things that are going to happen. People are going to be saved. And when I say saved, I'm using God's definition of saved. I'm using what he says in the Bible when he said they got saved. I'm not using what we call it when we get them in to our fellowship and try to make them as mean as the rest of us. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about when we put our brand on. I'm not talking about when we get them into our particular little fold. I'm talking about when God Almighty, through a supernatural act, moves upon their heart in convicting power through the preached and witnessed Word of God and the testimony of Jesus, and they are born again from above by the Spirit of the living God. I'm talking to you about redemption. I'm talking to you about the kind of redemption that is so real and so genuine that you become a sheep of God's pasture and the redeemed of the Lord. And when you hear his voice, you recognize it. And you hunger to hear his voice. And when you hear his voice, joy bells begin to ring in your soul. And you know it is the voice of Jesus. You have a longing to hear that voice. And when you hear that voice, if you've been redeemed, you will march through the crowds of murmuring, criticizing, condemning men to follow Jesus through the gates of hell. You will rip it from its hinges and storm hell for the glory of God. I'm talking about born again by the Word of God. I'm talking to you about becoming a new creation in Christ where all things have passed away, all things have become new, and you know it. You knew it then, you know it now, you'll know it forever. You are a child of the King, for the gospel comes in power and in much assurance. I'm talking about being saved. There are many of you here tonight who've come to attend the conference. There are many of you who may have come to look in on the conference who've never been saved. You don't know God. You try, you seek, you work, you're active. But 
but you've never heard him. I began to weep early in Arthur's message at a point. I began to weep at a point when Arthur said, I shudder to think what would have happened if I'd stopped praying at four when God said, pray all night. And God said, take the cross down. I'm talking to you about being born in the family of God so that you can recognize the voice of the Father and long to hear it and pay the price to hear it. Some of you have never heard it. You've heard many sermons. You've conformed to the preaching of men, but you've never been transformed by the power of a living God. You're not saved. You want to be. You'd like to be. You've tried to be, but you're not saved. You can go through this whole conference and you'll recognize truth because God has so anointed the preachers that you'll say, that makes sense even to my mind but it'll never become reality in your life because you've never been born of the Spirit. And you can't see supernatural works performed through an individual's life who's never been born of the Spirit into the supernatural world. You've got to be born again. Don't allow your pride, don't allow your affiliation, don't allow your association to hinder you and prevent you from knowing a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not talking to you about religion. I'm talking to you about knowing Jesus Christ in intimacy. I know him, and I know that I know him. I don't sit around hoping I know him. I don't sit around trying to find a plan to prove I know him. I don't sit around asking somebody to give me proof text. I know him. I know him. I've talked with him. I've fellowshiped with him. He's real to me. He became real to me as a boy. He started talking to me as a boy. He's communicating with me. I want you to know God still talks to his children. He speaks clearly. You can understand him. If you'll tune your ear to your father, you'll know his voice. It will never work contrary to the holy written eternal revelation in the word. But he talks to you. And he wants to speak clearly to you. If you're a child of God, you know it's so. If you don't know it's so, I don't care how many degrees you've got, I don't care how you've worked the system, I don't care how many people you've taught, you don't know God. If you don't understand, God still talks to his children. And he wants to fellowship with you. He wants you to have a, an intimate relationship with him. This week, tonight, people are going to be saved. God's going to save them. All this week, God's going to set people free. I mean really free. I wish you could have seen the preachers coming down the aisles this morning. No singing. Hard for them to even get down. They were weeping. They were wailing. They were broken. I prayed with preachers and took authority over every vile spirit you could imagine. Everything from lust and immorality and illicit affairs to homosexuality in the pulpit today were dealt with. In the pulpit. Don't turn up your nose. Don't turn up your nose. The enemy is so assaulting the people of God and bringing them into such bondage and such captivity that even those who may not find themselves in the grip of such vile sins as those I just mentioned are captured captivated, enticed, and being destroyed by religious spirits which they bow their knees to and they bow to a golden calf that they have sacrificed to build, they've given to build. God is about to shake it down, tear it down, throw it down, and you're trying to keep the stinking thing up. God will smash it. Everything holy God did not build on his holy word is coming down. All of it. The most difficult spirits I've dealt with in leading people through deliverance are the spirits of religious teachings and religious spirits. Pride puffs people. They hold to their traditions. A spirit of the Pharisees. Someone says a saved man won't have the spirit of a Pharisee. Why in heaven's name did Jesus keep warning his disciples of the very leaven of the Pharisees? Their teaching, he said, will ruin the whole loaf. 
And we've got a load of their teaching all over us today. God's going to set people free this week. My friend, you must understand, God will set you free. Oh, God. I never knew people could live as an overcomer as I've experienced in my own life. Dear Jesus. <laughs> He's going to deliver people. He's going to set you free from chains and shackles that you've been dragging all your Christian life and you're getting sick of it. And I want you to know he's going to heal people. He's going to heal them all over this building. And I want you to know I will not let the critics keep some precious little one that Jesus longs to touch from me telling them he still has a healing touch. And it's a wicked church and a sick body that is withholding so often his healing touch. We literally with our eyes earlier today witnessed a woman who came for healing become a spiritual conduit, a spiritual vessel, a spiritual channel through which God's power so flowed that healing flowed through her toward others. It was almost scary if you hadn't known who it is. But I want to tell you when Jesus comes, it is scary. When you're not accustomed to his presence, it's real scary. The disciples were more afraid of Jesus in the boat than they were the storm outside the boat. They fell before him in fear. Jesus, Jesus, when he comes, you may say, I'll shout glory, hallelujah. I think not. Not where we are today, church. I think we will fall before him in repentance, saying, holy Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty. God is going to reach out, and I somehow even sense that in the morning, God is going to begin to heal people at their seats all over this building. Now that's good if you're hurt. That's good if you're sick. I honestly think some people have such a religious spirit on them, they'd rather stay sick themselves than see Jesus heal somebody and mess up their theology. He's going to mess it up. If it's not what he says, he's going to mess it up because it's not what he says. I'm telling you, God's going to heal people just like he already did today and far, far beyond. In the morning, Dudley Hall is to minister. John Wimber John, stand up. This is John Wimber from Southern California, the Los Angeles area. He doesn't look like a teacher at Fuller Theological Seminary. Doesn't even look like a preacher to me. Amen. Author here is the guy to help you carry the cross, man. Y'all are suited up properly. John Wimber is brilliant. Thank you, Jesus, for the beautiful mind you've given but he just flows like Jesus. John is going to minister in the morning. Dudley has already said to me, if the Lord speaks a word to him, he's going to ask John to minister through his time and his own time. I don't know what the Lord will lead John to do, but I know whatever it is, it's going to look like Jesus here in the morning. And Peter Lord, thank you, John. Peter Lord is coming then to minister. And then at noon, Dr. Paul Youngi Cho from Seoul, Korea is to minister. Tomorrow afternoon again, Peter Lord. Tomorrow night, Dr. Jimmy Draper, David Wilkerson, and Dr. Paul Youngi Cho, and another pastor will be sharing. I want you to look forward with anticipation to simply seeing Jesus through all of these times. Would you do that? Now let me ask you something, and I want you to respond. I want you to communicate with me. I want you to answer me. You don't have to be loud about it, but I want you to communicate. Have you ever in your life and in your experience walked into a room 
And you sensed when you walked in that tension arose in the room in some of the people in that room when you came in. Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever walked into a room and you could sense an atmospheric change in that room, a tension? Have you ever walked in? How many of you have experienced that? You've walked in, you sensed that there was tension when you came in. How many of you have sensed when that tension arose in that room that somehow there was ill will toward you and that possibly you were not welcome? How many of you have sensed that? I like to see your hands. Hold them up or I can see them. Now, I've been meeting some people over the last 18 months who cause that tension every time they walk into a room if it's a church house. And I wanted to meet some of them because I'd heard how mean and bad and wicked and how troublesome they were. And I went to the trouble of meeting the troublemakers, lay people, workers, ladies, And I saw Jesus over and over and over and over. And I would listen as they would weep. I said, why is it that way with you? Well, I was dying and no doctor could help me. And when they said no hope, which may be the best words you'll ever hear, sometimes if you hear there's some hope, there seems never to be any. But when they'd said, there's no hope, I could only go to Jesus. And he healed me. And I went back and, and told everybody. And uh, uh, I don't know. And then they would cry. And I'd say, I don't understand that. But it's true. Now let me ask you something. Would you like for Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit of our God to feel tension when he attempted to enter this assembly? Or would you like to say, Holy Spirit, come. Welcome, Jesus. Some of you say, that's what we're saying. Yes, I know that's what you're saying here. That's what you're saying with your lips, but that's not what you're saying with your hearts. You know how I know? Because you've said to one of his members in his body, you're not welcome. I don't forgive you. I don't even like you. And then you say, welcome, Jesus. And he says, no. No, you've not even welcomed these others. You say you love me and you can't see me and you don't even love your brother and you can see him. He says, you're a liar. He's going to come where we love one another. He's going to come where we're determined in him to be one in him and to love one another. I'm going to tell you this. If you're judging others and you're critical of others, and you're skeptical, and you're taking notes. Holy God is not welcome in your assembly. I don't care where you go, how loud you shout, how loud you sing, and how often you pray. He's not coming. All you can possibly do is stir more flesh. And we've been stirring flesh so long in the church that it's all we really know how to do. And even when we'll get into a flow, there'll be a tendency to move back into the flesh. He's not going to come and be here where he's not welcomed, and he's not welcomed where we don't love one another. We're to fall in love with one another tonight in him, right here. Could we have one fellowship, one group that would say, Jesus, we welcome you? You may say, oh, I'm going to love everyone sitting here. This is good. We're here together. No, you're to love those who've not loved you. You're to love those who may try to put you out. 
You're to love those who may speak ill of you. You're to love your enemies. You're to love your brothers. You're to let love prevail. Then he will feel welcome to come and dwell in our midst and do whatever he wills to do. You are to commit. You are to commit to one another in love, in unity of spirit, in him, in a bond of peace. You're to make peace with one another. You say, how do we do that? You forgive everyone. You forgive everyone. You say, they've not asked me to, nor had those who drove the spikes through the quivering hands of Jesus, who spit in his face, who twisted his beard, who plucked it, who pressed the thorns into his head, who mutilated his body, who stripped him before the world. And on the cross he said, Father, Father, forgive them, forgive them, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Doing. The church today in darkness doesn't know who's got them. Don't hate. Don't be me. We're not to train another army. We're not to get a new brand of cruelty, harshness, meanness. We're to receive the love of our Lord Jesus. You can't know how many of you would walk out of here tonight in perfect health if you would just forgive those you have ought against right now in your heart. A pastor, someone in your church, someone in your congregation, someone in your family. We've been trained to be critical. We've been trained to be judgmental. And it has to stop so that Jesus will be welcome to come here. Now, I want to know, do you really want to welcome him to come? He's not going to come and fill this house until he's welcome to fill this house. Now, he wants to fill this house. Now, he wants to come, and when he comes, he's going to control everything in your house. He wants to fill it. He wants to control it. He wants you out of control to the flesh in your own way, in man's way, and under his control totally. Now, would you let him come? You say, yes, but. I will say, come on, Holy Spirit, but remember, I'm a Baptist, and I've always been a Baptist, and we're always right. Now, Lord, you can come, but remember, I'm a Pentecostal, and you know what we want. Give it to us right now. And he's not welcome. You're to welcome him to do whatever he wills, and what he wills to do may not be anything like what you expected or even thought about or even desired in that invitation for him to come. But he will change you and he will begin conforming you into the image of Jesus Christ. Don't you want that? Isn't that what we need? Would you welcome him by saying in your heart to God in behalf of every person, who's ever hurt you or offended you, I forgive you. I forgive you. I love you. Would you be willing to say to that person, I forgive you and I love you? Would you be willing to go to someone whom you've offended and say, forgive me, I'm wrong? Would you be willing to get right with those you're out of fellowship with? Would you be willing, as far as you're concerned, to be at peace with all men? You will know this word will divide, but don't you divide. As far as you're concerned, Paul said in Romans 12, be at peace with all men. And that is our God-given responsibility. Now, when we move to that place of oneness, I believe with all my heart, God is going to begin to move in our midst and know he is welcome. 
We're not going out of here to get everybody else straight. We're going out of here to allow Jesus Christ to so live in us, to so love through us, to so shine through us, that we will, in fact, see him lifted up and he will draw men to himself and transform their lives. Now, that is the sincere prayer of my heart. I believe it's Jesus' prayer. I believe Jesus Christ is praying tonight for his body right here to be healed. I think that's the reason why many of you have come. You've said, Lord Jesus, I want to see you. I want to hear you. I want to know your word, and I want to act on it. I want to live it out and see you come in mighty power. Isn't that what you want? Let's bow our heads together. Lord Jesus, we're coming to you tonight and asking you to heal your body. We're asking you to reach out here tonight and so touch the hearts and minds and lives of men and women, young people, preachers, church leaders, that more than anything, they would desire to be like Jesus. And through that desire, they would act on your word. And even this moment, they would begin to love as they've never loved before. Lord, I know that in this beautiful crowd of people tonight, there are many who've never met the Jesus that Arthur talked about loving so much. The Jesus that sent him out to witness all over the world. The Jesus that, Lord, I love so much that I would leave everything I've ever known to please. Lord, there are people all over this building who've never met you. Lord, they've been in religious systems. They've tried one after the other. Lord, some of them have never been in religious systems. Whether they're in or out, they don't know you. And I pray this night in Jesus' name and for your glory, Lord Jesus, and for the sake of their soul that you would so deal with them that every lost person in this building would desire to know Jesus. Father, I pray they'd not be repulsed and turned back by the inconsistency of some of our own lives. I pray this night they would come to Jesus. I pray this night they would come to give their life to Jesus to be born again of the Spirit. Father, in the building here tonight, I believe that there are preachers, church leaders, teachers, members of various fellowships, born-again Christians who've learned to live with animosity and hostility in their own heart. Lord, some of them have been hurt. God, some of them have been talked about. They've been like Jesus and others have criticized them. But, God, they've reacted themselves. Lord, they've been hurt. God, I've seen them hurt. I've watched them hurt. I've watched them wonder, what do I do next? God, I'm asking you to heal your body so that they will find fellowship and love when they go into the church buildings. They will sense that the body is meeting in the building and it meets in love. God, I'm asking you to so touch people here tonight that they would be so distinctly different that people could tell they'd been with Jesus and not with a bunch of critics. God, I'm asking you to change their lives, even on this first night. And fathers, we've heard this challenge from our brother Arthur to go into the world and preach the gospel and witness. Father, we're reminded again and again of our responsibility to witness to people everywhere we go to tell them that you love them, we love them, and to reach out to them. Father, all over the area, in the hotels, motels, on the streets, the restaurants, give us a wholesome, loving, gentle, 
and compassionate witness to every person we see. Lord, if we mention that we've been to a Bible conference, may it be followed, may it be followed by the testimony that we've been with Jesus and we know him personally and do you know him personally? Have you ever met Jesus, our Savior? Lord, don't let anybody tonight be able to rest and go to sleep without having their heart burdened and even broken for the lost around them. When they leave here and go home, I pray they'd have a burden for their neighbors, their loved ones, their schoolmates, and the people they work with like they've never had before. And that with that compassion, they'd have a boldness and a courage to witness and to share Jesus. And Father, I pray that you would begin to so minister to your people right now that whatever their need, you would begin to touch them and meet it right now. Right now, I pray you will deal with them. In Jesus' name, while our heads are bowed and you're praying, and I believe that your heart is open before the Lord and that you want God even on the first night of this conference, you want God to begin a work in your heart and in your life that is real and it's genuine and you want this night to repent of sin that's been made known in your own heart through the Holy Spirit an attitude of unforgiveness lack of love lack of willingness to be one lack of willingness to forsake all to follow Jesus lack of compassion lack of concern lack of consistency in your life, God has convicted you. And you would say right where you are, I long to repent and for the Lord Jesus to change me even tonight, to give me compassion and to give me courage and to fill me with his love. The Lord wants to do that tonight. I want you to search your heart And I want you to answer the question in your mind right now. If something happened and I died this night, am I certain I'd go to heaven? I want to ask you that pointedly. If you died tonight, do you know you'd go to heaven? If you could take me by the hand and look into my eyes and say to me, James, if I died tonight, I know beyond any doubt I'll go to heaven. I'm positive. I am positive. If I died tonight, I'll go to heaven. I know it. I know it. I'm not just a part of a church fellowship somewhere. I'm not just a member of a church. I'm absolutely positive. My sins are forgiven. I've been saved. Jesus Christ is real to me. He talks to me. He communicates to me. He communicates to my spirit. I know my Father's voice. I am positive, absolutely positive, that I am saved. If my heart stopped beating tonight, I know I would go to heaven. I know it beyond a doubt, if you know that. Only if you know it. I pray to God that you'd not exaggerate. If you know it, I want you to slip your hand up where I can see it. I'm absolutely certain. You may lower your hands all over this building. You may put them down. How many of you who could not lift your hand would say to me, James, pray for me. I could not put my hand up a moment ago and tell you I know I'll go to heaven if I die. I couldn't tell you I know that I'm saved that I know I've been forgiven, that I know that Jesus is in my heart, and should I die this night, I'll go to heaven. You couldn't say that. How many of you would be honest enough to say, James, I could not say it because I do not know that Jesus is really living in my heart and that I'm going to heaven. I want you to pray for me. I could not put my hand up a moment ago, but I want to lift it now and I want to ask you to pray for me. Would you simply slip your hand up where I can see it?
and hold it up all over this building. God bless you. Keep them up real high where I can see them. Way up in the upper levels, hold them up high. Hold them up high. Pray for me right now. I don't know if I'd go to heaven if I die tonight. Jesus, save every one of these people right now and some that don't even have their hands up. I want those of you with your hands up, if you will receive Jesus into your heart, if you will receive Jesus into your heart to let him forgive your sins, to deal with your sins, to cleanse you of your sins, and to put his life in you and change your life, I want you to get up and come right down here where I am right now. And I want you to just come right here, and I want you to kneel down right here with me. I'm already here, and I want you just to come and kneel right here with me. I want to pray with you right now. Just get up. Those of you who said, James, pray for me. If I die tonight, I don't know if I go to heaven. If you want to settle it, if you want to get right with God and be forgiven of your sins and let Jesus come in your heart, I want you to come, and you can just kneel right here. Just find a place where you can just kneel right here. Come on right now. Just come on. I want to give my heart to Jesus. Just come on, brother. God bless you. Boy, I bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Come on right now. You may want to bring somebody to Jesus with you. Come on right now. You may be a church member. My wife sang the special music the morning she got saved. Jeannie Rogers did the same thing. She sang the special music the night she got saved. Come on right now in the upper levels. Some of you drove all the way across the country to go to a Bible conference, and the first thing you're going to get to do is meet Jesus. Come on right now. Come on, ladies, some of you, listen to me. The Lord impressed me when I first started that there were some very elderly people here tonight. I'm talking about who own up in the very late years of their life who need to be saved tonight. There's some right out here in front of me. The Lord impressed me, need to come. That's, come on, right now, that's it. Get up. Don't you let pride, don't you let pride, don't you let religious association or affiliation keep you from coming to Jesus. Some of you just happened into the building tonight. You just came in. You didn't even know where you were going, what you were going to. And you've come in, and you're going to meet Jesus tonight. There may be some of you who could turn to a friend next to you and say, come on, let's go together. Some of you come as a couple say, you know, we both need to know Jesus as our Savior, Lord. Some of you have known religion. Boy, I've been in so many, many places. Many, many places where people have been to church, and they go to church, but they don't know the Lord Jesus. They don't know Jesus. Come on right now. Those of you at your seats, you just be thanking the Lord and praying for these precious people. I'll tell you, if this were your daddy and your mother and your children, you'd be happy. You'd be happy. You just thank Jesus. There's precious people right here. Jesus died for them. Boy, they're so special. Some of you in the upper levels in the balcony, now don't leave. You come down the steps and down through that exit to the lower floor and come right on down here, right on down here. I want to know Jesus. Aren't you sick and tired of just having a religion and not really having a relationship with Jesus? Don't you want a relationship with Jesus tonight? Well, that's why we're coming right here. Come on. Come on right now. Just come on right here. Now, as you get on your knees, I want you just in your heart there to just sort of tell God about yourself right there in your heart. Just tell God about yourself. Just say, Lord, I... Boy, I need you, Jesus. You just sort of tell him right there where you are, kneeling. Boy, I need you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, God. Lord, I tell you, one thing this conference needs right off, Father, is just a great big burden for souls. Now, Lord, I know we've seen the flesh until we're sick of it. We're sick of our own, and we're sick of all of it in the church. Lord, this is not flesh tonight when folks are coming to Jesus. This is when angels start shouting. Oh, God, if we got something to shout about, this is it, Lord. In our soul, we got to be happy in Jesus. People get to say, Lord, break the hearts of our people here tonight, all over this place, for souls. Jesus, Jesus. Come on, anybody else want to come? We're not in a hurry. I didn't preach long tonight. All I did is introduce you to what the Lord's going to do this week. This is a good place to start right here, isn't it? Come on. Come on. Somebody's daddy's meeting Jesus or not. Somebody's daddy's your kids don't even know they're here and they're getting saved. They never knew their daddy could get saved. Some of these kids didn't know what saved is. Daddy's going to get to tell them. Come on. 
I'm so happy some of these folks went out and got people off the streets and brought them in here. Some of these sweet old boys been running around winning souls all day. They've been out in the halls winning souls. I want all of you kneeling here. I want you to look up here at me for a minute. All of you kneeling here. Reach up and put your hand on the person in front of you. And those of you right here in front of me, reach up here and, and uh, hold my hand. Come up here and sit by me, brother. That's my buddy right here already. I got a special buddy right here. Oh, I love you. <laughs> oh, I love you. Oh, I love you. Oh, I love you. Daddies. Oh God. So many daddies. Those of you kneeling, look right here at me now. Listen to me. Do you understand God loves you? It doesn't matter what's ever happened. Listen to me. Jesus. Jesus is sufficient. He died for your sins. Do you understand that? He took your sins. He took your sins in his body. And he died for you. Do you understand that? Jesus died for you. For you. When he looked out from the cross and said, Father, forgive him, he was talking about you. No matter what you've ever done, he said, Father, now look, Father, forgive him. Forgive him. And his blood covers all your sins, brother. Do you understand that? All of them. All of them. Sister, sweet thing, do you understand that? All of them. Now we're going to ask him right now to just cleanse them as far away as east is from the west and to give you eternal life that he's bought for you. Okay? Can we just ask you to do that? Let's bow our heads right here together right now. Just bow our heads right here. I want all of you kneeling, I want you to say out loud after me. I want you to pray after me. And I want you to pray out loud, but boy, I mean it from your heart. You're talking to God. Amen. You're talking to the Jesus who died for you and lives to live in you. We don't need more church, folks. You're not becoming one of the bunch. You're becoming part of his body. You're going to be born into the body of Christ, don't you ever... Stop loving God. Don't give us any more of what we've got. Oh, God, deliver us from what we've been begetting after the flesh. Deliver us from the disciples of men and give us some disciples of Jesus. Lord, they may not look like much, but be much in them, God. Give us disciples of Jesus. We've had it with our flesh. My God, save them tonight, Jesus. God, save them tonight. After your spirit, God, bone of your bone, spirit to spirit, save them. God, save them, oh God. And may our heart burn to see more of them saved, not counted, numbered, and branded. My God, deliver us from religion, God. Get the curse off of us, God, and give us redemption tonight, God. Oh God, give us redemption tonight, Jesus. Oh, God, those of you kneeling here, pray after me out loud and from your heart and mean it. Dear God, oh, be my God. Be my Father. I need a Father. Somebody to understand. Somebody to love. Somebody to talk to. Someone who will talk to me. And I can understand. Save me, God. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. Set me free from sin and its power. Break the habits. Break the shackles. Cleanse me, Lord. I'll be white, Lord. Whiter than snow, Jesus. I'm clean, Jesus. 
I'm clean. I'm saved. I have life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just look up here at me. Hey, brother. <laughs> oh, bless God. Isn't he a wonderful Savior? Isn't Jesus wonderful? Don't you love him, church? Not if you don't love each other. Not if you don't love these precious people. Oh, they're precious. God, they're precious. You think you wouldn't want to touch one of them? You wouldn't want them in your car. You wouldn't want them in your church because they don't look like you. Oh, God, may they never look like us. Let's all move on to look like Jesus, please. The Lord wants to send you out to touch somebody in love tonight. Don't go make them religious. Don't go make a Baptist out of them in a Pentecostal. Go tell them about Jesus. Please. Please. Oh, God, thank you. I want all of you kneeling right here to walk right over there. Rick, you go around there and get those books. New Life. I want to give you a book like this. Why don't you take it on with you? I'm not interested in branding you. I just want to help you a little bit, all right? And they're going to go right over there to the side. Just walk right over there to the side of the platform. Those of you kneeling here, walk right over there very quietly. And I want you to get one of these books. And as soon as you do, you can go back to your seat, all right? Just walk right over there. And I'm going to give you this one, brother. Boy, I love you. I know it, brother. I know they do it. The rest of you, you keep your seats now there where you are, please, while our friends, so precious, move over here just to get a little helping hand. I'm going to see the fuel in the door. Brother, listen to me. Johnny can pray with my brother right here. Boy, listen, it's not, it's not clean, it's repentance, but you're being honest because you don't feel like we're doing anything in your heart. I want you to pray with my brother right here. Go sit by with daddy. This is like one of the best buddies right here. I <laughs> Bless you, brother. Bless your heart. Praise God. I know who you're going to. Bless you, brother. Oh, and that sweet brother. His brother loves you. His brother James Robinson deals in a very personal, intimate, precious way with some who are coming forward to give their lives to Jesus. Let me urge you there at home or wherever you may be across this land to Take a step as though you're in this auditorium. Take a step and move toward God. Uh, the easiest way we know to do that is to have you move to your telephone. And there's a number on your screen. And I know that many of you will want to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. If you were here in this auditorium, I know you would want to come forward and join with those who've just come and received Christ as their Savior and prayed that prayer with Brother Robinson. We don't know how to do that except to tell you now at home to get to a telephone as quickly as you can. Right now, while you feel that urge, that call of the Spirit of God, I can't impress upon you enough the importance of moving now while that want to is there, while that urging is there. That's the precious Holy Spirit. You can't get saved any old time you want to get saved. The Word of God makes that very clear. You can get saved only when the Spirit of God calls you in conviction and makes you realize you're a sinner. And then that moment arrives when you know and God knows it's your time for you to find Jesus and to confess Him as Lord. Please do that now. Honey, join me in prayer. I feel such a yearning in my spirit, and I know many are making that decision now. 
But I know your enemy is also there, and he will do everything he can at this critical moment in your life to get you to... And his favorite trick is to just put it off for a little while. Just delay. Just wait a little while. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that the precious Holy Spirit is calling many, many, many precious souls to convic through conviction to faith and new life in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we praise you for that now, Lord. Holy Spirit, we plead with you to, to send your convicting power to everyone under the sound of our voice who is lost tonight. Do that precious work that only you can do. We come against the enemy, that foul spirit that would try to continually blind men and women and keep them from knowledge of salvation. We come against that spirit now in the name of Jesus and bind it through the victorious power of our Lord Jesus Christ. And by the Spirit of the living God, we loose men and women, boys and girls, to obey that call of God and to open their lives and then to boldly declare and confess with their mouths that Jesus Christ is their Lord. Father, we praise you for it and thank you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You are free, and I know many of you, every time I pray that little prayer, honey, I feel in my spirit uh, a vicarious lifting of the spirit, and I know that you are feeling that, many of you, and you're moving now to your phone. If you don't get through right away, please keep calling, please keep dialing. In fact, I am authorized to tell you that, uh, and I thought Brother Robinson was going to mention it himself tonight, but he has a very special book that he wants to send everyone who will call that wants to receive it. And um, I'll have a little more information on it tomorrow night, and I think he'll even be mentioning it himself. But uh, for those of you that want to receive uh, a Bible and some material that we will be happy to send, but then Brother Robinson has a very special book that he wants to send everybody that will phone in during these three nights as we come to you live from the great Dallas Auditorium, Dallas, Texas, with the James Robison Crusade. Well, honey, I feel... Uh, oh, here's one right here. Thank you. Um, I will mention this. Ah, yes, it, and it's written by James Robison. It's entitled, Somebody Help Me. It's a very important little booklet for those who need the help of God and feel in bondage and need deliverance by the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, there is somebody who will help you. And this little booklet will be on its way if you will simply pick up the phone and call the number on your screen. And as you call us, of course, tell us if you have received Christ as your Savior because we want to send you some things too. Well, this is a great first night, isn't it, from the great Beautiful. Dallas Convention Center. And I think, honey, the theme of what the Spirit of the Lord is saying is so evident and so clear. I've sensed it in the weeks of revival we had from, from Melody Land, and I've sensed it in our own Praise the Lord programs. The body must come together or Jesus won't come back. It's just that clear. It's just that simple. The body of Christ will be one. It must be one. It is not now. But thank God for uh, voices crying in the wilderness like a James Robinson that God's Spirit is upon and He's calling this precious body together. Too long we've been our own little fractionalized, scattered uh, groups and denominations and cliques and bunches here and there. And it's time now. It's time for us to lay these walls and these barriers down and to come together in the Spirit of the Lord. I'm going to read a little scripture for you in a minute. In fact, uh, have you got a little word to share? And then I, I'd like for you to read a special scripture in the Living Bible because I know it'll be a little clearer. You know, I never could understand, and I'm really glad that I don't understand why just because you might not agree a little bit 
on the interpretation of a portion of scripture that you didn't love somebody because they thought that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What in the world is that? Because you interpret a portion of scripture to mean one thing, and I may not see it that way yet, but why would you not love me just because I don't interpret it the do same you, way you do? Do you want a shockingly frank answer to that? I think I know what you're going to say, but say it. It has to be said, honey, uh, and I speak because I've been a pastor. Yes. And and I'm 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 sad to have to say this, but in some instances, I'm not going to make a blanket statement, but in some instances, shepherds and leaders, and boy, read in Ezekiel how oh, the prophet Jeremiah. speaks to the pastors, mm -hmm. the pastors, the false pastors, the weak pastors, the inept pastors, the pastors fat. that, the Shit. fat, over, mm. overfed, uh, who, who live off of their the starving babies. sheep. Mm -hmm. Yes, God's word is very, very harsh with the pastors, and he holds pastors by a higher standard than he does the sheep out there. They're supposed to know more. They're supposed to understand the word better. They're called to lead. They're called to be shepherds. But to answer your question specifically, we have been taught, and I have to confess that I grew up in a denomination too, and it wasn't really stated in direct terms, but you kind of learned it by osmosis. You know what I mean? that we sort of allowed the others, you know, we allowed they would get into heaven, but we really were the repository and the depository of, of the real, true doctrine, the, the true dividing of the Word of God. But it doesn't end there. It gets worse. In some cases, pastors have wanted this division and this sectionalizing of the body of Christ. They didn't want their little sheep out of their pen. They didn't want them exposed to other truth. They wanted them in their little sheep pen because they wanted the tithe off of them. They wanted the income and the support off of them. They didn't want those little sheep to be able to get out and mingle with the other sheep and for the body to truly become one because they feared that they would lose support. They feared they would lose their position. They feared they would lose their job. Now, uh, that is as brutally blunt as I know how to make it, but it's got to be said because in some cases this was the truth and is the truth. You know, that isn't the case, though, in the ones in the churches oh. because they have nothing, you know, to gain or lose by going to that church. But it seems like even the feeling among the people is, you know, I am of Apollos. <laughs> and you are of someone else. Yes. And I don't understand. I just can't understand. I remember when I was growing up, I wanted to date a boy. And he was just a great kid, you know. And I asked someone in the church, I said, do you know so-and-so? Yeah. I, I, you know, I'd really like to go out. And he's asked me to go out. I'd really like to go Honey, don't you know he's a Baptist? Mm -hmm. I went, Sure, I know it. What's that got to do with it? Oh, well. You know, and I See, I went, you know, and I couldn't understand then. I don't understand now why I couldn't love somebody just because they don't interpret the scripture the way I do. And I just don't understand that. And I, I remember I read in Dad Bilheimer's book, he says, you know, God is all truth. He is all know. He wrote this. This is his mind. Yes. So he knows the truth. And if everything was written, there wouldn't be enough paper, enough, you know, <laughs> pen and ink to write all of the things that God wants us to know. But he put enough in here so that we can make it to heaven if we believe in the blood of Jesus Christ and all the beautiful things about Jesus. So we can make it to heaven. But he put enough in here so that we can live in this earth together too. He knows all truth. We are just striving to know. 
And Papa Billheimer says that God is working out that beautiful agape love in the body. Mm -hmm. And that even though you and I don't interpret the scripture the same, we still must just love each other to pieces. And Jesus said in a beautiful scripture in John, all of John is the love scripture. You should read it all. But he said this, he says, he said, I'm giving you a new commandment. I mean, we know of the Ten Commandments, but this is a new commandment that Jesus Christ is giving us. The Eleventh Commandment. Right. Or the First Commandment. The this is what <laughs> Jesus yes. Christ is saying. Love each other just as much as I love you. Your strong love for each other will prove to the world that you are my disciples. That you believe in eternal security proves you're my disciples. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no. That, that you speak in tongues. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure, that's in here somewhere. Surely. <laughs> oh, I'll find it. <laughs> yes, I'll find it for sure. <laughs> that you... Um, uh, Cast out take, demons. Well, but and, mm -hmm. and also that you uh, take communion every service, proves you're my disciples. That you give to missions. No. It says that you love each other. Your strong love for each other will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Mm. I love you. Are you a Baptist, Jay? I love you. Arthur's a Baptist. I love yes. him. Who else is it? What are you? Presbyterian. Presbyterian. Love you. What are you? Non denominational. Non Jesus <laughs> person. I really love you. <laughs> Jan, Jan's polling our cameramen here and, and uh, our staff. Yeah. We have ca Matt there. Okay, there's a Catholic back there. We love you. Love you. They're all calling out all denominations. Just if we love Jesus and truly believe. Now, there are some things that uh, we truly just must learn. And if you're being taught things from the pulpit that doesn't witness to you, get your own little Bible down, your own living Bible, your own King James Version, whichever one you enjoy reading, and just study it for yourself. The same Holy Spirit speaks to your pastor will speak to you. Yeah. The same Holy Spirit. Let me, let me say one other word right here that I believe the Spirit would, would want us to share. Beware of any teacher who tells you you have to believe only the way they believe. Beware. Beware of that. That becomes, in its ultimate sense, a cult. And it ends up with a Jim Jones experience down in Guyana where everybody blindly follows some kind of a leader or teacher or preacher or whatever he may be. You get a hold, just like Jan said, of your own Bible. And you know what? Let me tell you what will happen. If everyone will take everything that man has ever tried to program into your mind about what's right or wrong or what the word means here or there. And if you will simply read it anew and afresh with a totally open childlike mind and spirit, I think we would all absolutely be astonished at how close we would all come to the same knowledge of the Lord Jesus, the same practice, the same worship, the same everything if we would simply do that one little exercise. We have been taught to be divided. We have been taught, as Brother Robinson said tonight, to hate. We have been taught to be divided from our brothers and sisters in the Lord. We've been taught and carefully programmed by man to not be one, to not be a part of the body of Christ. We're going to have to do some deprogramming. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to have to do some unlearning. Mm. We're going to have to forget some of the things that have been taught to us. Now, I'm not putting everything down. Thank God for good 
wonderful teachers of the Word that have taught us many good oh, things right. and many wonderful things. I'm not putting all teachers or preachers or things uh, that have come to us through chosen vessels down. Please don't misunderstand me. But I'm telling you one thing. If this body is ever going to get together, and it is, by the way, with or without me, or with or without you, this body is coming together because I happen to believe that Jesus' prayer is going to be answered when he prayed to his Father that we all might be one. So I want to get in tune with and in line with the Word of God, and I want to be one with my brothers and my sisters. You know, there's a very special scripture in Galatians. And um, the thing that all of us are striving to do, the reason we, even Trinity is here, we want people to enter the kingdom of God. That's what it's all about. And there's a very special scripture in Galatians that tells us that if we do any of the above, we will not inherit the kingdom of God. And one of them, I think, will kind of shock us. Galatians 5 says, But when you follow your own wrong inclinations, your lives will produce these evil results. Now, the following are evil. And listen to the category that one of these special things is in. Impure thoughts eagerness for lustful pleasure, idolatry, spiritism, that is, encouraging the activity of demons, hatred, fighting, jealousy, anger, constant effort to get the best for yourself, complaints and criticism, and listen to this one, the feeling that everyone else is wrong except those in your own little group. Hello? <laughs> and these, and listen to this, envy, and in that same category of evil, murder, mm. drunkenness, wild parties, and all that sort of thing. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. The important thing to remember here so that Satan doesn't pull another trick on us and get us under condemnation. Every one of us have committed one or more of these sins. What the Bible is saying here is that we don't practice them habitually. We don't live that kind of lifestyle. We may do one or more of these things, but do you know what the greatest proof that you really are a child of God is? Do you know what really proves that you are born again, the moment you do one of those things, you absolutely feel rotten. <laughs> Guilt. The, right. the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes immediately. If I do something wrong, I <laughs> feel horrible immediately. That is the proof that the Spirit of the Lord lives in me, and He doesn't want that kind of activity going on, and so I feel bad. And that's, that's good because that's the signal that I should repent. And when I do, if we confess our sins, John says, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he's not talking even to sinners in that passage. He is talking to ch children that's of God. Right. Let believers. me go on just a little bit further. It says, but when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, and that's what we all want, he will produce this kind life, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And you know, and then Jesus makes it so beautiful, just right on down the line in Galatians 6, says, but dear brothers, mm -hmm. still talking to us, if a Christian is overcome by some sin, you who are godly, now those of you that feel you haven't you haven't done any of these things. The Lord's still talking to you, too. He says, if, if someone else has that you know done one of these things, they've done it. They've been overcome by one of these sins. You who are godly should throw them out of the church. Mm, criticize them. Oh, criticize them? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, excommunicate, excommunicate them. them. Um, uh, send them to some 
Where else? No. Don't let them back in your church. Talk about them. Ooh. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Have a prayer meeting and pray about them and repeat all of their sins. You know, there's a lot of prayer meetings that are nothing mm -hmm. but just gossip, gossip sessions. Boy, be careful of that. Be just aware be of care. that. No, what dear brothers, if a Christian is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently mm -hmm. and humbly yes. help him back onto the right path, remembering that next time it just might be one of you mm. who is wrong. Share each other's troubles and problems and so obey our Lord's command. What a command is that? That you love one another. If anyone thinks he's too great to stoop to this, he's just fooling himself and he's really a nobody. Mm. So there's a little something in there from a murderer, drunkard, crit criticizer to the most godly. A little lesson in there for all of us. Father, that they might be one, yes. even as you and I are one. So godly ones, lift those you don't agree with back into the path. <coughs> if they've been taught something or spoken something, lift them back. Love them. Love them through it. And that's very special. Chapter 12, 1 Corinthians, verse 12. In fact, read it 12, from the living 12. room. 12, 12. Read okay. those next several verses. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. Our bodies have many parts, but the many parts make up only one body when we are all put together. So it is with the body of Christ. Each of us is a part of the one body of Christ. Some of us are Jews. Mm -hmm. Some of us are Gentiles. Some are slaves and some are free. But the Holy Spirit has fitted us all together in one body. We have been baptized into Christ's body by one spirit. Isn't that wonderful that there's one Baptist spirit, one Pentecostal spirit? And have all been given that same Holy Spirit. There's only one. You know what? Hold it right there. Mm -hmm. Honey, the Holy Spirit just dropped a word into my heart. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been hearing, and I've heard it so often, that the body is divided, the body is fractionalized, the body... And on the surface, it certainly appears that way. But the Holy Spirit just dropped a word into my heart. His real body is not mm. divided. I think some of the institutions and some of the parts that we've been calling the body of Christ are not the body of Christ. This book says that there is one body and that it has many parts, and that the yes. body does work together. So what I am sensing from the Holy Spirit right now is there is a beautiful, united, indivisible, perfectly functioning body of Christ in the world right now. Whether I am a part of that body is up to Do me. Mm. I believe that's a rhema Do word from the Lord right I now. I, I really do. You know... I've heard so many admonitions and good words, and certainly we always want to urge and call the body to unity. But you could almost get discouraged and think, well, dear Lord, is there any hope? You know, we still see so much of this division. We still see so much vying for supremacy and so much, you know, my little group is right and your little group is wrong and all this mm -hmm. kind of thing. But, oh, no, no, there is a beautiful, mm -hmm. glorious, united, Paul spotless <laughs> body of the Lord Jesus Christ in Marching. the world now, right <laughs> now. It's functioning. It may not be something you can see, you know, in your little group right now, but it is there. And I believe there are elements of that true, victorious, overcoming body of Jesus Christ in every church, in every denomination, in every part of this world, in every continent. And I just urge every one of us, 
if, if, if we're out of the body right now, if we're not in fellowship with that body, let's get in. Let's come on in. Let's join together. And this week, you are going to have as good an opportunity as I have ever heard of to be blessed and admonished and taught and called and commissioned and brought into the true living body of our resurrected Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to be a part of that glorious body without spot or wrinkle or any such blemish, ready for Jesus to come, ready for the bridegroom to take his bride. Honey, do you remember that rhema word the Lord gave you on the way down to Jerry Bernard's that Sunday you were dedicating his church about where we were in the body, oh my, you don't have time. 30 seconds, tomorrow. I'll tell you tomorrow. Tomorrow night. Tomorrow. It was tomorrow. Do you remember what I'm talking about? I know, yes I do. A very beautiful little truth yeah. the Lord gave to me. You have to say good night. But we'll be back with you again tomorrow night from the great Dallas Convention Center as we join with Brother James Ramos and David Wilkerson, Pastor Cho from Korea, John. Arthur Blessed, John Wimber, so many. Move to the phone right now and make that call. Good night. God love you. We love you. And remember, let everything, everything that has breath just be one in the Spirit. Pray. We're so glad you've been with us for Praise the Lord. If you haven't asked Christ in your life, call our prayer partner now and pray to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. If you'd like an audio cassette of Praise the Lord, please write and ask for program 125-84. That's 125-84. If possible, tuck in a love gift to help defray the cost of the tape ministry. TBN has a worldwide ministry. We need your love gifts, large or small, to help you with the gospel of Jesus Christ going around the world. So write today, praise the Lord, P.O. Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711. Paul and Jan would like to thank you for your prayers and financial support. You keep us on the air. Thank you. This is Jim McClellan saying, God bless you. And remember, let everything that hath breath, praise the Lord. This program was brought to you by the prayers and contributions of our faithful partners throughout the United States of America.